Elizabeth Cady Stanton, born November 12, 1815, was a woman that showed her desire to excel in intellectual spheres since her early years. After she graduated from Emma Willard's Troy Female Seminary in 1832, she was drawn to the abolitionist, temperance, and women's rights movements. Her involvement in these events caught the attention of a local group of activists that embraced equality and community and participated in women's rights as well as anti-slavery movements. Jane Hunt in particular, a part of the social activist group, decided to send Stanton an invitation to a tea party in her home, where she had met yet again Lucretia Ma, a Quaker activist Stanton had known for well over eight years, along with Martha Wright and Marianne McClintock. All women later on recognized for the formation of the women's suffrage movement. When united, these women were prompted to hold a women's convention in the United States. This was the first major public appeal and the start of the barrier breaking in the 48th year of the 19th century. In 1848, the Women's Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York, when women began to realize that in order to achieve reform, they needed to win the right to vote. They fought for the social, civil, and religious rights of women. Although this meeting was not the first in support of women's rights, it was a meeting that officially launched the suffrage movement and which ensured women the right to vote through the 19th Amendment decades later. On the first day of the convention, July 19th, only women were allowed to attend it, and 300 women showed up. This day, the Declaration of Sentiments was read, a document drafted by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, inspired by the Declaration of Independence. As formed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, this document claimed that, We are assembled to protest against the form of government existing without the consent of the governed to declare our right to be free as man is free, to be represented in the government which we are taxed to support, to have such disgraceful laws as give man the power to chastise and imprison his wife, to take the wages which she earns, the property which she inherits, and in case of separation, the children of her love. The following day, July 20th, the convention had been open to both men and women. On this day, 12 resolutions were passed that were signed by 68 women and 32 men. A month later, a second large convention was held in Rochester, in which the Declaration of Sentiments gained 107 additional signatures. The resolution in this document included that all laws which prevent a woman from occupying such a station in society as her conscience shall dictate, or which place her in a position inferior to that of man, are contrary to the great precept of nature, and therefore of no force or authority, that woman is man's equal, was intended to be so by the Creator, and the highest good of the race demands that she should be recognized as such, that the women of this country ought to be enlightened in regard to the laws under which they live, that they may no longer publish their degradation by declaring themselves satisfied with their present position, nor their ignorance by asserting that they will have all the rights they want. That inasmuch as man, while claiming for himself intellectual superiority, does accord to woman moral superiority, it is preeminently his duty to encourage her to speak and teach, as she has an opportunity in all religious assemblies, that the same amount of virtue, delicacy, and refinement of behavior that is required of a woman in the social state should also be required of men, and the same transgressions should be visited with equal severity on both man and woman, that the objection of indelicacy and impropriety, which is so often brought against women Woman, when she addresses a public audience, comes with a very ill grace from those who encourage, by their attendance, her appearance on the stage, in the concert, or in feats of circus. That woman has too long rested satisfied in the circumscribed limits which corrupt customs and perverted application of the scriptures have marked out for her, and that it is time she should move in the enlarged sphere with her great creator has assigned her. That it is the duty of women of this country to secure themselves 
their sacred right to elective franchise, that the equality of human rights results necessarily from the fact of identity of the race in capabilities and responsibilities, that the speedy success of our cause depends upon the zealous and untiring efforts of both men and women, for the overthrow of the monopoly of the pulpit, and for the securing to women an equal participation with men in the various trades, professions, and commerce, and finally, that being invested by the Creator with the same capabilities and the same consciousness of responsibility for their exercise, it is demonstrably the right and duty of women equally with man to promote every righteous cause by every righteous means, and especially in regard to the great subjects of morals and religion. It is self-evidently her right to participate with her brother in teaching them, both in private and in public, by writing and by speaking, by any instrumentalities proper to be used, and in any assemblies proper to be held, and in this being a self-evident truth growing out of the divinely implanted principles of human nature, any custom or authority adverse to it, whether modern or wearing the hoary sanction of antiquity, is to be regarded as a self-evident falsehood and at war with mankind. Thanks for the doings of the women's suffrage movement, teaching became a respectable job for middle-class women. Working in factories as seamstresses were also considered respectable jobs. They were given a very low salary for this hard work. However, they were content to fill this position because it was an opportunity to get out of the house. Since now they were able to earn their own money, though it was a small amount, it gave women more independence, which is what they wanted all along. By the end of the 19th century, the number of female students increased. The founding of colleges for women as well as events at women's rights conventions challenged society's views on women's traditional roles. Higher education was broadened by the rise of women's colleges and the admission of women to regular colleges and universities. But although now women were able to attend colleges, it was not in the same amount as men. Access to education helped women improve economically. It led to more and more women to sense their potential for meaningful professional careers. Their salaries increased but not to the amount that men received. However, this still was a huge success for women because it was such a big step from what their society had looked like before. The success of the women's suffrage movement in the 19th century was the entire reason for the accomplishment of the 19th Amendment in the early 20th century. The 19th Amendment states, the right of citizens of the United States vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. This meant that women finally had voting rights. This amendment was passed by Congress on June 4th, 1919 and was ratified on August 18th, 1920. We know that the story for women's rights came along long before the Seneca Falls Convention. However, this convention strengthened into what we know as the women's suffrage movement, the movement that pushed past society's viewpoints and managed to empower women, the movement that with time allowed women to vote, have political stands, have property rights, get proper and rigorous education, and have professional careers. This movement resulted in the largest extension of democratic voting rights in American history.